Chapter 13.1, lesson number two. We talked about oxidation and reduction, and now we're going to talk about something known as the electron transfer theory, which is, in the end, the theory that describes everything we're going to do here in chapters 13 and 14. And we're just following, hey, where do those electrons go? They have to go from one place to another in these electrochemical reactions. And so we want to be able to, number one, find where they are, identify them, and see if we can track where they're going. We did something like this in the past, and so what I'll get you to think about is those net ionic equations that we were doing in Chemistry 20. Um, and this can kind of highlight for us what's ultimately going on in our electrochemical reactions. Now, for this, what I want you guys to do is write the net ionic equations for some single replacement reactions. Now I say this with a little bit of trepidation because while single and double replacement reactions are the first place that we've seen even the briefest hint of electrochemistry, I don't want you guys to follow the mechanism for them uh, beyond chapter 13.1. All right, we are going to open the door on electrochemistry and we're going to look at a whole series of other styles of reactions in which single and double replacement are only the most simplified of our electrochemical reactions. But if we take some time to investigate them here, all right, what we'll find is that we can follow the electrons quite easily through this and identify the processes of oxidation and reduction without even really having studied them yet. Okay, so let's take a look at this first one here. Copper metal reacts with a silver nitrate solution. So move over here to a blank sheet of paper and we have copper metal reacting with silver nitrate, which is AgNO3, and we said it was a solution. Now in a single replacement reaction, we again were taught long ago to follow the cations or the anions, and I have two metals or two cations here, so they replace each other, meaning that silver now exists elementally, and it is copper to nitrate that gets formed. Okay, we can kind of go through and balance this. I have two nitrates, which needs two silver nitrates, gives me two silvers, and the coppers are good. So this was the non-ionic equation. When we were getting into net ionics, what we had to do is we had to dissociate and ionize certain things because we know that if I put certain species into water, they don't exist as we might look at them on the page. Copper, such as pennies, if I drop them in water, elements don't generally do any sort of weird reactions with water. And so my copper in the total ionic equation would stay the same. But silver nitrate, being a soluble ionic compound, doesn't just dissolve, it also dissociates into its various ions. So I can't give you a solution of silver nitrate. What I end up giving you is a solution of silver ions and nitrate ions. We just simplify the process by saying, hey, this is a silver nitrate solution. So I would actually get two silver one plus ions in solution, and I would have two nitrate ions also in solution. Okay, so looking at things ionically, we see that what's happening in the beakers is a little bit different. This also explains, and where we were using it before, as to why certain ionic compounds, when turned into solutions, form electrolyte solutions. Because while this was a neutral compound, once it dissolved, water pulled it apart into its positive and negative parts, and now I have charged ions floating around in that solution. Silver, if I get my silver ring wet, it doesn't dissolve into anything sort of weird, so I just have two moles of silver as a solid here. But copper to nitrate, according to our solubility chart, is also soluble, and so it must dissolve and dissociate into its ions, and so we get copper two plus ions in solution, and we get two nitrate ions in solution. Okay, I hope this is uh, coming back to you guys. All right, we dissociate all soluble ionic compounds, and we ionize any of our six strong acids. Those are the only things that really go through a change when we go between the non and the total ionic equations. To get to the net ionic equation, all right, what we did is we looked for things that were called spectator ions. In other words, we're looking for things that went through no change in state, nor a change in charge. If we follow copper, it was elemental, but now it's ionic. It went through a change, so it obviously participated in some sort of reaction. 
I have silver ions here, that has a charge. But after the reaction, I had elemental silver. So it's gone through a change and been involved in some sort of chemical reaction. But here I have two nitrate ions, and afterwards I have two nitrate ions, both of them hanging out in solution. In other words, nitrate, while available here, didn't actually participate in the reaction, but it went through no phase or sign change, and so it gets cancelled out as a spectator ion. Oops. Okay, and so it was really not participating in the overall reaction. And so if you take a look at the net reaction, I have solid copper reacting with two silver ions in solution to produce solid silver and a single copper ion in solution. Now this is all well and good. This is stuff we did all through Chem 20. And uh, we took a closer look at what was actually taking place in our beakers and our reaction vessels. We can go one step further here and we can take a look at which species gained and lost electrons. So we can start getting into the redox of these single replacement reactions. And if you take a look at copper, it was neutral. But if I take a look at copper on the other side here, copper has lost two electrons. It's got a two plus charge now. So I can see that I have lost electrons as copper transforms from elemental copper into copper two plus. Now ask yourself, what is the name of the process that describes loss of electrons? The name of that process is oxidation. So we can identify that copper is oxidized in this chemical reaction. Well, if it lost those electrons, where the heck did they go? Take a look at silver. Silver starts out as a one plus and finishes as neutral. If I'm a plus one charge, then I'm going to have to gain a negative charge or an electron in order to become neutral. And so silver is gaining these electrons and therefore is undergoing reduction. Okay, so copper lost electrons and was oxidized. Therefore, it was the one that was responsible for silver getting reduced. So I might call it the RA. And silver, undergoing reduction, was therefore responsible for copper losing electrons and could be considered the OA. So there's everything we were doing in the first part of this uh, lesson, talking about oxidation, reduction, reducing agents, and oxidizing agents. And though having really done anything in this unit so far, other than review net ionic equations, we've been able to identify which things are losing electrons, which things are gaining electrons, and therefore becoming oxidized and reduced respectively. Okay, uh, what I'll have you guys do is try one more. Okay, in the next example, we have aqueous chlorine reacting with aqueous sodium bromide. I'll get you started on that one, and then I want you to pause the video, go through the total ionic and then the net ionic, and then see if you can identify which species gained electrons and which species lost. Okay, so kind of doing the process that we just did. But here, let me help you out with the uh, non-ionic equation for chlorine reacting with sodium bromide, and then you guys can try that one on your own. So here's the non-ionic equation in which we have aqueous chlorine, so that if Cl2, all right, I can dissolve non-metals. They just don't go through any third, further changes. And then I have sodium bromide, so the NaBr. And if we followed our Chem 10 mechanism, we would have the non-metal switch places here. And so bromine would be kicked out on its own. But remember, bromine is also diatomic. And then this would create sodium chloride. Balance these things out, two chlorines, one chlorine, there we go. That gives me two sodiums, two bromides, there we go. So everything is now balanced. What I'd like you to do is do this full process here. Remember, you must dissociate uh, any soluble ionic compounds, and you must ionize any of the six strong acid, acids, which we don't have here. So pause the video now and see if you can come up with the total and the net ionic equations for this single replacement reaction. And if you can, Try and come up with the oxidation and reduction for uh, your net ionic equation. Okay, pause that now. Good luck with it, and I'll see you in a few minutes for the solution.
right, welcome back, guys. Uh, here we go. Here's the total. All right, chlorine being elemental doesn't go through any sort of special changes in water. It's already dissolved, but it doesn't form any sort of new ions, unlike an ionic compound of soluble sodium bromide. So that would break apart into two Na plus ions and two bromide one minus ions. Bromine being elemental, no special stuff going on there, but we do have another soluble ionic compound in which I have to create two sodium ions and two chloride ions in solution. I go through now and I look for my spectator ion and I see that sodium has gone through no change in state or charge. So it is just a spectator ion here and therefore non-participatory in the reaction. This means that the net reaction is only between elemental chlorine and the bromide ions I have in solution. That produces for me bromine and two chloride ions in solution. Can we identify from this which species has lost electrons and which species has gained electrons? Well, if we take a look at bromine here, I'm already starting out as a negative. So I'm a negatively charged ion with extra electrons compared to my protons. But over here, I'm neutral. The only way that works is if bromine has lost electrons and therefore went through oxidation. Where did those electrons go? Well, take a look at chlorine. Chlorine starts as neutral, a balance of electrons and protons, and finishes off as two negatively charged chloride ions, which means it has picked up extra electrons somewhere. And so, chlorine must have undergone reduction because it has gained electrons. All right, I hope that makes some sense, and I hope you guys were able to find that, and your uh, example that you tried on your own went very well. We could go one step further, and we could take a look at, since chlorine is being reduced, it must be uh, getting reduced by something, and we could title bromide as the reducing agent. Because bromide was oxidized, we could title chlorine as the oxidizing agent. So we can see both sides of the coin when we take a look at this process here. Okay. Uh, there you go. I will uh, put together one more video here for you guys on 13.1 as we'll talk about what are known as half reactions in order to be able to clearly identify and work with these oxidation and reduction pathways.